Okay, well, I, I, the uh, question, why did you bring a Tiger II all the way to Sweden uh, instead of, for example, the Panther that's in Munster, in the Tank Museum in Munster, which would have been a vehicle that was from Sweden uh, and went to, back to Germany? Yeah, um, there is a simple answer to that. Uh, we've been asking Munster, would it be possible to have the Panther on loan for a period of time? And the answer was maybe. And then all of a sudden the, the opportunity came up with this going back to the UK. And since we actually had a King Tiger once, Yes. But we only have parts of it left. Okay. We thought it could be of interest to show how it re the, the, th the tank that we had looked like, because it was very similar to this one. Yes. This is a, a prototype, and the, the one that we had was one of the first produced. So we thought, why not go for the King Tiger, and perhaps we can have the Panther in the future, if yes. they are yes. kind enough to, to okay. let us... So, so uh, later we, we, you we have, have a, a few bits you. left. <laughs> <laughs> so later you hope to be able to show that double torsion bar that is yes. uh, so beloved in Sweden. The connection <laughs> with Sweden. So the, this has yeah. a connection, but another yes, connection. a so, different one. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, I suppose when one looks at this, you're, you're seeing the biggest and mo most powerful tank that Germany produced during the war. I mean, uh, what surprises many people is that the actual requirement for such a tank uh, was issued back in 1935. Of course, it wasn't this design. This design came about after many iterations of the development of a heavy tank. But uh, this certainly is the iconic Tiger II in the end. Um, the things we talked about on this previously was that this has a turret that's only seen on the first 50 vehicles and this was the turret that was designed originally by Krupp to mount on uh, the Porsche Tiger II which then was a cancelled project and 50 of those turrets were still available so they were, they were mounted on the first of these uh, Tiger IIs. Um, so that, it's from there that the expression of the Porsche tur turret, which is not a correct name, probably yeah, it's, came. It's more of a nickname, really, yes. because it came from... It, the design was actually built originally uh, to be fitted on this Tiger II, which Porsche company was involved in the design and development, nothing else. They, did, they designed the chassis for this but this never came about. So rather than throw the turrets away, they were used for this purpose. But even before this was, uh, was ready, they had done the wooden models and it showed the, the later turret, which was known as the Syrian term, the series turret. Um, so that wasn't anything uh, that you hear very frequently where it's associated with Henschel. Henschel knew nothing about the turret. They were just given some specifications to allow space and they, they got a turret which was designed again by Krupp because primarily Krupp were responsible for the 88mm gun and they were responsible for designing turrets to house that gun. Mm -hmm. So there, this is the same type of turret that the Swedish Tiger had, and let's have a look at yes, the, the, yes, the remaining parts of, okay. of that tank. So this is what we have left from the Swedish King Tiger. The gearbox and this cabinet, we have the rear turret hutch, uh, which was found where they, when, in 1950, when, when they used it as a target, they first used it on, on a test range where they penetrated it a lot and did a lot of tests with um, anti-tank rifles of different kinds and from these tests we had this hollow charge projectiles 84 millimeter yes, which yes. was then used in the Carl Gustav 
and the tank rifle, and then later the same diameter is now in the AT4 that's used by many countries and also in today is used in Ukraine. So there's a, mm-hmm. a, a, there is a connection from yes, these yes. first tests that yeah. they did. And then when the turret, well, the, the tank was, was a scrap, they, they took the ter- turret and moved it to um, the shooting range not far away. So there it kept be, become a, a hard target for, yes, for many years. Yes. And uh, as we understand, this hatch was found on that spot. So they recovered mm. it and brought it to, to the museum. And then there we have the engine. So these are the remaining parts. There is a track link in the museum in south of Sweden, but apart from that, right. the tank is gone. So that is why it's interesting to show the people in Sweden. And of course, other, this is the connection to, to Sweden. And yes what we did back then. Today, of course, you can say, what did you do that for? Why did you use it as a target? But in those days, it, well, it was part of the development. Mm-hmm. And today, we <coughs> shoot other vehicles to pieces to evaluate. And, yes. and in 50 years, people would say, why did you do this? Well, it's the same. Yep. So is there anything that you would like to add about these? Well, I mean, the, the, the rear hatch from the turret is, is quite a precious thing because there aren't many of them around. Even the vehicle from the tank museum doesn't have one of these hatches. So anybody who wants to study the thing in, in total can see this, not only the outside, but the inside. So that's, even though it's a small piece, it's a, it's a unique piece of history. And then to look, a, look ahead at, at what was saved from outs- inside the vehicle, that the gearbox was saved, that's pretty impressive um, because that, that's a Maybach Ulvar transmission. Maybach had quite a considerable experience in developing pre-selector gearboxes. The, uh, they were designed in, in, in a time to make the driving of the vehicles easier because there wasn't many skilled drivers around. So for the small uh, one-ton half-track, Maybach supplied pre-selector gearboxes that were vacuum-operated, um, and that was to make the driving simple. The same was really true here. They were trying to come up with a gearbox and transmission that was very simple to use, that uh, fairly poorly trained drivers could handle such a big vehicle as this and without damaging the vehicle because with a manual transmission, obviously you, if you change to the wrong speed at the wrong time, you're putting too much strain on the gearbox and that will fail. But with the Alvar, you had a pre-selector gearbox and that made the whole driving experience much better. So that's a very important uh, uh, item for study for even for modern technologies. Um, And I suppose the other part that's uh, remaining is if we look at the, the engine, which is the HL230, this is extraordinary because you can see how short this engine is and yet it still delivered 700 horsepower and then in the final versions that were supposed to come along for the for the Tiger 2 they were going to change the carburetors for fuel injection and ultimately get up to 900 horsepower so you're approaching the sort of performance that you get from a modern power pack um, and the and connection. Why, why, why did they have this compact uh, size? Well, that was even discussed back in 1935 when, when the heavy breakthrough tank requirement was mentioned for the first time. They called in Maybach and said, You have to develop an engine with 600 horsepower. And he said, That's pretty far advanced from what we've got today because at that time, there was only the 12-cylinder uh, DS08 engine, which it was in the Swedish M31 tank. Which is standing... Which at the other end of the museum. And this was only 150 horsepower. So that's where they were starting from. And Maybach 
knew that it would take many years to develop a reliable engine and we know from the history when this engine was first used in in the Panther that for the first number of months it was pretty unreliable but very quickly they established a list of 28 things that needed to be done to those early engines and then it became relatively speaking reliable but right at the beginning they specified that the engine compartment can only be a certain length because every time an engine gets longer you need more armor to yeah, protect the engine the, the, the vehicle gets longer and, and the vehicle heavier. gets longer and the, the germans had a fixed ideas about what the maneuverability and steerability would be in terms of the length of the vehicle. So this was a very compact power pack and Maybach was responsible not only for the power pack itself but also for the cooling, radiators and all that went with it and it all fitted within this compact space within a Tiger II or indeed a Panther. So it's a very, very important uh, artifact to have and there are very few of these uh, engines remaining. Um, collectors that have he heavy vehicles are always mad keen to get hold of an original HL uh, 230. So um, it's amazing and to see the predecessor in terms of the 12 cylinder engine sitting in the M31 uh, uh, wheel come track it's it's you see the whole progress of the engine development so these are the bits of the original uh, Swedish King Tiger um, but then maybe we go and talk about the actual one that we have at the moment in the museum so what, what can you tell us about what we see from this side? Well, there's, there's lots of interesting things because the Tiger II now, this, all this, this is a Versuchsfahrzeug, so one of the test vehicles. Uh, this is number two actually. And uh, what we see is some changes that were made during its life because when it was with the test uh, establishment in Kummersdorf or San Juan and so forth, they were changing things. But the basic design of the suspension uh, was, was the latest improvement on what we had seen with the Panther because what you have is you have two wheels on the outside and two wheels on the inside. The Panther had one wheel on the inside, one wheel on the outside and then these two just the same. But they found that they could give the same performance uh, with this as long as you had these steel tired wheels. Now the the name steel tired wheels is a bit of a misnomer because inside in this particularly wide section of the wheel there is actually a rubber tire but this in a very heavy vehicle it's interesting because this protects the rubber tire from being destroyed and there was a number of reasons one was the damage to the tires and the second was that Germany was very short on rubber so they were looking always for methods to avoid using rubber even at the end of the war down to the removal of the rubber base for the radio antennas they put in a steel spring base on the antennas so everything was being done to save on rubber so that's the suspension it's interesting if people wanted to examine it you have two of the the wheel stations here where only one wheel is fitted this one is missing so you can see the inner section of the the pair that are normally on the outside another point to remember about this particular Versuchsfahrzeug is that it it has track from the very last model that was being introduced in the war. This single pin track is, is the last variation of this. And this, funnily enough, wasn't done by the uh, Germans. After the war, when this vehicle was found in the uh, Henschel uh, test ground, um, alongside it was another uh, test vehicle, and that had this advanced track and modified drive sprocket. The British took this off the, that one because the gun and things were damaged on that one and they put it onto this one to make a complete one and it was brought back to England for testing. The, the other little notable features um, would be to look at the turret and you see here on the turret bulge where the commander's cupola would have normally been uh, mounted but that's missing. You have the 
small circle up there is the machine pistol port that they ha had envisaged back in the days of the when the Porsche Tiger II was being designed. There was a pistol port for the commander and then this bigger hatch that's welded closed was, a, was for um, handing out messages to people outside the vehicle without having to dismount. Uh, so, but so, they so were sort of a letterbox. Yes, except, absolutely. I mean, there are there are pictures. Uh, there's some, I've seen a picture of one of the Panthers, early Panthers, where there's a guy on a horse taking a message from the guys inside the tank, so they didn't have to dismount. But this was dispensed with at this stage, so that's welded closed. But it's still very interesting if somebody wants to study the vehicle, they get to see features that they won't see anywhere else. You could, as looking at it, you could assume that there should be another pair on the outside. It, it looks like if you compare to, to the Tiger, but so this, this is the, the, the correct way it should be? Oh no, that, this is absolutely correct. This is the final iteration of this style of uh, development because with the other methods, with the inside and outside wheels, um, they had discovered, of course, that there's a danger of the buildup of mud and in cold weather that mud would freeze and uh, could cause problems for the crew. Uh, so this was the latest style of that and it's easier to replace easier to replace the, the wheels if they get damaged or the, the suspension unit if it gets damaged on this than it would have been with say a Panther. But then the later uh, iterations of the Panther they were already thinking in terms of going over to this style. Do you know why they didn't adopt this kind of track from the beginning? Why use the, the, the double link? No, I, 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 don't, I don't really know. I, I've never seen a document that explains exactly what was going on. But the double link, which would have been sort of one track link and an adjoining plate, one track link and adjoining plate, uh, I can only speculate that that must have been at the time the, what they thought was the best way to carry such a weight as this. And don't forget these vehicles were always expected to have to uh, have the tracks removed yes. for transport so they would put on a narrower track for rail transport and maybe we could look over at Per Sonovic's uh, beautiful model uh, sitting on a rail car over there, we can look at that in a moment. Yeah, so <clears throat> they, they took off this track by hand I suppose, Yes, yes. Uh, so you know, normally do roll it up and then well it the weight, I would assume, is about two and a half tons at <laughs> least. And then put on another track, enabled to, to drive on onto the, yeah. to the trailer. And then someone picked this two and a half ton and That's put right. on, on, yeah. on something else. I mean, else. The putting on and off of it, obviously the weight is a tremendous issue, but the, the method was to use the drive sprocket to yes, turn yes, and yes. to pull a cable to pull yeah. it forward. So. Theoretically, that's an easy job. <laughs> yes, I, I've, I've done it on, on Centurion. I'm sure you've done it a few yeah, times. So it's not, not that bad, but, but it's a, a lot of work yes, just yes. To, to be able to transport the thing. Yeah, but, the, but the, uh, the, the railways were in existence for, by the 1940s, they were in existence for over 100 years, and they had already built all the bridges all of the tunnels, all of the, all of the stations had platforms and all of that had to be avoided and no matter how big you wanted to make your vehicle you had to have it so that if it went, was going to be transported by rail it had to be down to the, and this is the, this is the governing width, it can't be any wider than that and if you get any wider than that, somewhere in the railway network, it will bang into the side of a bridge or into a platform or something. They, they had a, a, a sort of standard configuration for the, 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 the maximum yeah. size of, of, of the well, vehicle. Certainly in Ireland, when I worked in the railways, we had what was known as a standard loading gauge and it was a shape that you could put uh, a vehicle. So this vehicle is made as big as possible, I guess, um, to fit within the loading gauge. And so when I'm, most of the bridges, they went uh, in a curve shape um, and the slope, soaked armor facilitated that and had to take that into account. 
So th this sloped armor might have been a reason for, for making the, the vehicle fit better into this low loading. Well, certainly it helps on that yes. uh, issue that, you, you know, the only place that's going to be a problem is if it gets any narrower or wider than that, it will cause a problem. So this vehicle had a, um, a set of Schurzen plates yes. that fitted down here to protect the vertical armour in there. And those also are taken off. And they are quite heavy by comparison to the ones that were used on a Sturmgeschütz or a, a Panzer IV. Um, but they had to come off and they were se a separate load. Mm. So tra transporting a vehicle, and, and I remember from when we brought it in here, it's a, it's a heavy thing that you have to, to bring along. And I suppose that when, when they use these tanks, they they try to, to move them by themselves, but long distances would have been a big problem due to wear of the tank and also for the fuel. So what kind of, of um, uh, alternatives did they have for, for, for well, transport them? Yeah, they to, had to, to move they them, had. If, say if they are in, in one section and then all of a sudden the enemy turns up 100 kilometers away, how to get there? The, uh, certainly in the Second War, it was almost exclusively moving by rail. So everything was designed to move by rail. They did have some, uh, they had designed some heavy uh, trailers uh, to take uh, this type of vehicle, but they didn't, be, they didn't move into common use primarily because at the time they were designing them, there was no known uh, towing vehicle, uh, an 18 ton half track, which was designed to tow something like a Panzer IV on a trailer, um, that couldn't handle one of these. So there was a, um, a solution in that you could hook a number of uh, 18 ton half tracks together to tow. So there are some nice photographs of three. Uh, 18 tonners pulling this, but I mean, that's such an enormous uh, arrangement with three of those huge 18 ton tractors, a trailer and something like this on it. It's a, it's a very difficult um, load to move on the, on the roads that were available to them at that time. Yeah, we had when, when we bought the Centurions to Sweden in the 1950s, we also got a, a trailer from, from UK to well, to put, to put the, the vehicle, the, the tank on, but then to have something to, to tow the 50 ton tank, including the, then the quite heavy trailer. Trailer, They yes. used to have one Volvo truck, uh, there was an artillery um, pulling tractor at the front and one at the rear with a tow bar. Yes. And they, they had a telephone cable from the first vehicle to the second yes. vehicle, so they could com communicate which, which um, gear to have, etc. Yeah. And that was a, a mm -hmm. difficult situation to, to use this and to transport, but they didn't have anything that was heavy enough or powerful enough yeah. to, to, to deal with this. Well, in theory, a Berger Panther would have been able to do the job, but they were in such short supply um, and they were really needed for. Uh, recovering vehicles in the battlefield uh, and towing them out. So uh, the heavy tank battalions were authorized to have three Berger Panther and by middle to late 44, the establishment was uh, that two of these Berger Panther would have been the rebuilt Panthers that were manufactured or assembled by Siebert and one of the real Berger Panthers that had a winch and a spade and so forth and therefore was able to do the initial pulling but the two um, Siebert Berger Panther didn't have any winches or any facility on top of them so they were just operating as anchors or they could be used as a tow vehicle to tow away this. They also would have been equipped with the HL mm -hmm. 230 so plenty of power. So you had the, the sort of the, the strong guy and the helpers. Yes, exactly. Uh, okay. 
Um, I think we should look at the, the front of the, okay. of the of the turret, yep. because there is something that you will yep. explain.